Well, uh, I'm Heinz Seinemann and uh, uh, I was just asked about my early days in uh, Germany and I went to school in Berlin and I went to the university in Berlin at the uh, Te Technische Hochschule, the Institute of Technology, until uh, I had almost finished my PhD. I submitted my thesis and I was told the thesis was not accepted because I was Jewish. Uh, this was, of course, in the early Hitler days, and I had to leave and found, was successful in finding that the University of Basel in Switzerland uh, would accept my thesis so that I could, with one year stay in Basel, uh, get my PhD, except I had to have a philosophy exam. While in Berlin, I would have gotten a degree in natural sciences. I got a degree in philosophy, which uh, was sort of funny, because the professor of philosophy, when I first talked to him, told me, well, you can't learn in one year, but takes normally many years, so let's agree on one subject. And we agreed on, uh, the, uh, his on the history of natural science. And uh, when it came to exam time, there was, of course, a lot of members of the faculty around. And uh, the philosophy professor came in, saw me, knew we had agreed on something, but couldn't remember what we had agreed on. So he started probing around, and then decided we must have agreed on the history of physics. <laughs> and start, well, we sort of muddled through, and instead of getting, and I did well in all the other subjects, and instead of getting a, a, magna, a, a summa cum laude PhD, I got a magna cum laude, <laughs> and nobody has ever asked me about what kind of a degree I got once I had it. Well, I came to the United States right, fairly much right afterwards and worked in Louisiana and Texas in different refineries and found that uh, I didn't know enough uh, physical chemistry particularly and went back and did a postdoc at uh, Carnegie Tech and uh, with Ernst Berl and had my girl of the girl saddles and had my traumatic experience uh, in teaching because this was the uh, time just before this country got into the first into the second world war 1941 and Burl was the chief consultant for TVA and had to spend more and more time at TVA, and I suddenly had to take all his classes, for which I was totally unprepared. I was literally one lesson ahead of the <laughs> students. So I have really never wanted to teach after that until, oh, a number of years ago when I was semi-retired and had the opportunity to, and there was nothing to lose, but I was at one time offered a professorship at Princeton when Michel Baudard left Princeton, uh, but I turned it down flat because I just after that traumatic experience didn't want to have anything to do with teaching. Well, I continued in uh, mostly research in uh, various smaller companies and eventually got to Hudry Process Corporation and worked with Alex Oblet and Alex Mills at Hudry. And in 1953, at one of the first meetings of the Philadelphia, full day meetings of the Philadelphia Catalysis Club, I had a luncheon conversation with Rudolf Brill, who was then teaching 
at uh, Brooklyn Polytech before going back to Germany. And uh, we discussed how nice it would be if we could have more than the usual group of people of the Philadelphia Club and maybe had both a national and international meeting. And I took that idea of Brills and mine uh, to the Philadelphia Club and uh, they, like usual, in such cases, they said, oh, that's a good idea, you do it. And uh, so I got stuck with setting up an organization and of course there were lots of people involved beside myself. Uh, I was the uh, uh, executive secretary of the first uh, Congress, but of course uh, the very, one of the very first questions was how are we going to finance this? And uh, Alex Oblad and I went to see Eugene Houdry at that ta at one time there and told uh, Houdry what we wanted to do and Houdry was a very enthusiastic man when he liked something he went all out for it and he said oh that's a great idea and he said how much money do you think you need? Well we had done some careful calculations that you have to remember this was 53 or 54 and the dollar was worth a lot more and we said well I th we thought with about $8,000 we might be able to put the, the show on and he looked at us and he said I can't raise $8,000 for you 50000 yes, <laughs> 8000 no <laughs> so we said well this is perplexed you can raise 50,000 go right ahead. <laughs> and, uh, he was as good as his word. He got uh, Dunlop, who was president of Sun Oil Company at the time, to write a letter to all the presidents of the big oil and chemical companies saying this, there was to be this Congress and Sun Oil was giving $2,000 and would they match it? And the money just started to flow in. And we got almost $50,000. And that's the money that started the International Con First International Congress, with which we were able to bring about 25 people from the different parts of the world to the meeting. And in fact, after the meeting, had uh, something like $10,000 left over which largely financed the second congress in Paris and I think started the fund which continues. And I mean every congress now has to pay money as you well know into the pot. So many funny things happened with this first congress. One I particularly remember is uh, in the I think the Congress started on a Sunday night and I was fairly exhausted with the preparations and I was asleep in my room in the Bellevue Stratford Hotel when at two o'clock the telephone rang and here was uh, uh, the, the porter and he said there are four people here from Russia and none of them speaks English <laughs> and we had invited several people, but none of those came, instead four others came, but nobody notified us who would come, uh, what. Fortunately, one of the four was, uh, uh, oh, what's his name? Wolkenstein. Uh, the physic, physic, Wolkenstein. <laughs> and uh, Wolkenstein spoke excellent French, and so here, I, I don't speak excellent French, but at least I can make myself understood and understood in French. And we communicated and got some settled. And uh, from there on, they participated in the meetings. And there are very, many stories about them. Another thing that happened was that before the Congress, I got a letter from India 
on stationery the government of India and it said, uh, I can't quote it exactly approximately, uh, Sir, you are hereby notified that Sir Edwin Ghosh, Minister of Culture in the government of India, will attend the first international congress on catalysis and you are hereby requested to afford him all the anemones in accordance with the station. <laughs> Very sincerely yours. <laughs> and so we wondered what to do. To, do you put a band in the <laughs> station when he arrives or what? But it turned out he was a very modest and very nice man, except to us. But he also kept the other two or three Indian scientists who were there totally busy because he wanted, he felt he ought to give a banquet for the officers and foreign guests of the Congress. And since he only arrived on Sunday, he decided that should be on Wednesday night, and the invitations had to go out in uh, engraved form on the very good uh, stationery. So these poor Indian scientists had to run around Philadelphia to find an engraver who would quickly do this and to distribute the invitations, etc. Well, again, the banquet took place, and it was all very well done. Another wonderful affair was one that Eugene Goudry gave uh, in his house in, uh, on the uh, Ardmore Line in Philadelphia. And uh, uh, I remember the Russians being at that meeting, and here was this beautiful house there's lots of original paintings in it, impressionist paintings, Renoirs, Matisses, etc. It was like a museum. And uh, uh, I remember Wolkenstein admiring this, and he said, do you live like that? And I said, no, not quite. <laughs> uh, he says, but you have a washing machine, don't you? He says, you have a dishwasher? I said, yes. He said, in Moscow we have no washing machine and no dishwasher. <laughs> I have to add, however, that in 68, when the Congress was in Moscow, uh, Wolkenstein invited a number of us, Michel Boudard, I remember myself, uh, and uh, about 10 people to his home for dinner one night. And they did have a washing machine by that time. But of course, he was a member of the academy, <laughs> so he was elite and privileged. Well, shall we leave it at that? Well, uh, who was the one that got the Philadelphia Club started, or do you not? Well, the Philadelphia Club got started at a meeting in uh, my uh, home at the time uh, by a group there who was put together by Bert Farkas. And there was, if I, record, if I remember correctly, uh, Farkas was there, Mills was there, Oblat was there, Knut uh, Krieger was there, uh, Hansford from Mobile at that time, and uh, Kennedy from Sun Oil Company, myself. And uh, Bert had the idea that uh, he wanted to structure this like a British club. With, uh, if he got enough people, rent an apartment or so where you would go and chat and have a bartender, etc. Well, it never worked quite like that, but uh, uh, we did decide to have a Philadelphia club and uh, started meetings. And I think it was, as I don't remember who was the first speaker, I think it was Paul Emmett and uh, who graciously agreed to come. 
And another funny thing was the second one was a man who is here now, Dennis Stout, who happened to visit in the United States, gave a wonderful talk. We usually had anywhere between 10 and 15, 20 people. Uh, we had the meetings at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and usually met for dinner in a restaurant around there just before uh, the meeting. Uh, Dennis came, he gave an excellent talk and we felt very obligated to him because this was a new organization without any uh, reputation. So we decided we ought to send him some gift and we had a little pen holder uh, engraved with uh, to Dennis Stauden from the Catalysis Club of Philadelphia and mailed it to him. And as Dennis tells the story, he was notified by customs in England that there was a package for him. And he couldn't imagine what it could be and what he might have to pay duty on. So we went there and they, they, they asked him what it was. They said they didn't know it was a gift, so they opened it and they found this. And the customs officer says, oh, a sports trophy. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's the way uh, Dennis got it. I don't know whether he still has it. But uh, it, the Philadelphia Club grew very rapidly. And, uh, oh, I forgot, at the original meeting, Frank Theopedra was there, too. And Frank, of course, always was very active. Philadelphia Club. So uh, all of the founders served uh, in the first six or seven years as chairman of the uh, Philadelphia Club. I think uh, Oblat was the first one. And uh, uh, Charlie Plank, who was not, as I remember, I may be wrong, at the founders meeting, but he was chairman of the Philadelphia Club when we brought the idea of the International Congress to the Philadelphia Club. So the club grew rapidly and we decided to have annual meetings. But at the time, no company would give you time off to go uh, to a meeting uh, other than in the evening when on your own, in other words, you had to go on your own time. So the first 10 or so of the Philadelphia annual meetings were held on Saturdays. And uh, at first, uh, uh, where were the first ones? I think at the University of Pennsylvania. And then at the DuPont Country Club later on, somebody at DuPont, uh, made arrangements for that. And, uh, that was a meeting in 53, I think, when we, when Brill and I had some talk I mentioned before. How did you come to go to work at Hoodry? Well, uh, I told you I did a, the postdoc at, well, I had been at Atapulco's Clay Company which was a joint subsidiary of uh, Atlantic Refining and uh, ESSO. At the time, Exxon didn't exist yet, <laughs> Standard Oil of New Jersey, and produced clays and bauxite for absorption and catalytic purposes. And uh, I had a disagreement with the management uh, when it, oh, the research management changed and I decided that I should look around for another job. And uh, knowing Alex Mills, I wrote to Alex, uh, among many others, and made an application for a job. So they invited me for an interview, and that's how I got the job at Tudri Process Corporation. I started there on uh, January 1st, 1948. 
And how was the management set up at Hoodry? At Hoodry, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, president of Hoodry Process Co. Uh, Eugene Hoodry had left the company by then and set up his own separate company, uh, Oxycat. Okay. And uh, uh, the president of Hoodry Process Corporation was Charma Cockbright, who at one time was president of the AICHE and uh, uh, later was uh, administrator of Erda. And uh, uh, reporting to him was Alex Oblad as director of research and uh, Jack Dart as director of development. And uh, uh, Alex Mills was associate director of research and I became a section manager in the research department. I had the uh, advanced research, uh, the, uh, essentially uh, the uh, first stage after basic research, first stage of applied research. And uh, I was at Hoodry for what, seven or eight years and uh, then Alex Oblad decided to leave because we, the company was going in directions which were led really away from the research we had done, as you know, that was one of the best research organizations of the, in the country at the time. And I mean, there were people uh, like Farkas and uh, Milliken, etc. So uh, it, it was an excellent organization, but uh, I suppose we didn't make enough money for the <laughs> company. And Alex Oglet decided to leave, and uh, uh, be he became vice president of research for the M.W. Kellogg Company and asked me to come with him. And uh, I joined Kellogg. Uh, in 58, I guess it was, as assistant to the vice president, and later uh, changed to the laboratory and became director of chemical and engineering research at Kellogg. And uh, uh, Alex and I uh, were there for about 12 years. So then I, from there, I went to Mobile. What happened at Kellogg was we were very successful. We developed about four or five commercial processes, but uh, it was very, a difficult situation because Kellogg was, of course, an engineering construction company, and uh, uh, they found it difficult to not only license, but also uh, build and construct uh, the processes. There was always a conflict. Uh, you, they couldn't very easily bid on bids on other uh, processes because the other companies would say, well, you have your own, you ought to do that. So eventually Kellogg decided to concentrate on the engineering construction business and to reduce research. And at that time, I was lucky in finding a job at Mobile. Uh, first, uh, as you well remember, in the uh, Paltzboro uh, laboratory. And uh, then a year later, was transferred to Princeton, which was nice for me because I happened to live in Princeton. <laughs> now, when you were at Kellogg, did you get involved in Fisher Tropes with South Africa? No, no, that was it's, all over that in was those over. days. No. Uh, and in Kellogg, I got very much involved in uh, 
a two or three, of course, we got involved in cat cracking in the early stages. Well, not early stages, as they also had done. It's the early stages of moving bed and fluid bed, cat cracking. At Kellogg, uh, I was very much involved in the Kelchlor process, the uh, uh, conversion of HCl to chlorine and the Deacon type process, but in a new system which was non corrosive. And it was a, it's a complicated system, no sense describing it here, but it's all published. And uh, uh, we also developed an isopropanol process, a new way of hydrating uh, propylene very efficiently. We developed uh, the uh, uh, short contact time uh, ethane cracker to make ethylene, which made a lot of money uh, uh, for the uh, Kellogg company. And uh, oh, we developed five or six processes that all went commercial, usually together with uh, another company, for instance, Kelchlor, we developed jointly with DuPont, and the isopropanol process we developed with Amoco. And uh, uh, while I was at Kellogg, uh, I was at a meeting one day, I was approached by Cy Meisel, who was then manager of process research at Mobile. Uh, telling me that they had a new cracking catalyst which uh, they had evaluated in fixed bed uh, cat cracking units, but they had no pilot plants, fluid bed pilot plants. So Kellogg had a fluid bed pilot plant of about three barrels a day capacity. And so he asked, could we evaluate that catalyst for them under secrecy agreements, etc.? So I brought up the question with Kellogg management, and they said basically yes, that the lawyers worked out a uh, secrecy agreement. And uh, so uh, we got the zeolite catalyst. Of course, we didn't know it, we're not supposed to know what it was. Because we knew pretty quickly, but uh, as I say, we was we are not supposed to, and we didn't talk about it. And of course, we were utterly amazed at the results we got. And uh, uh, so, <coughs> uh, in fact, this played a role later on. John Turkevich, who of course was chemistry professor at Princeton at the time was a consultant for us and uh, uh, a uh, consultant who was under secrecy agreement. And he was present one day when our analytical department reported on the first results of the cracking pilot plant, the octane number and yields of uh, gasoline, etc. And John said, that's an analytical error, that can't be true. Later on, uh, there was a suit of Mobile against uh, Davison and uh, against Texaco, I think, uh, for using the zeolite catalyst without being licensed. And I was called as a witness in that suit. And John Turkevich was uh, the witness for uh, Davison, and uh, I had to get up on the stand and tell the major John's remarks <laughs> uh, when he heard the thing, which of course demolished his testimony as that being a well-known, fully expected thing that it was not uh, uh, for us a patent. And, uh, of course, Mobile won the suit, as you well know. But uh, 
so that's my story. I retired from Wobel when I was 65 years old, and at that time uh, was offered, didn't want to retire. Mobile uh, offered me to stay on as a half-time consultant, and I got offers from MIT to join their, uh, what was the lab called, uh, uh, the petroleum lab, and uh, from uh, LBL, Lawrence Berkeley Lab in Berkeley, to join them as a uh, uh, senior scientist and decided I had shoveled snow long <laughs> enough and Berkeley was preferable to to uh, uh, Boston area and of course I could have stayed in Princeton and continued at Mobile but I had done that sort, that sort of thing for so many years so I wanted to do something different and I have been at LVL ever since retiring three more times in the process. Uh, how did the work come about for the uh, bifunctional catalyst? Uh, well, the bifunctional catalyst that came about because, uh, well, that goes back further. In the late 40s, when I was still at Atapurvis Clay, we had a contract with Union Oil of uh, California uh, for a reforming molybdenum re uh, oxide reforming catalyst uh, that they made the catalyst on alumina and of course that was a material that was used for dehydrogenation of uh, uh, metal site of uh, site of uh, metal cyclopentane and uh, uh, metal uh, cyclohexane uh, and uh, uh, of xylene to uh, of, to toluene etc. And they wanted to make it on bauxite. And while we were playing around with it, I had read the articles by, what's his name, of UOP. Uh, Thomas? No, uh, Kovan, uh, Slavic name, I can't think of it right now, who mentioned uh, precious metals' ability to dehydrogenate. So I one day said, well, why don't we put a little platinum on bauxite and see what happens. And of course, it did a wonderful job of dehydrogenating. But when I mentioned that to management, they said, you must be absolutely crazy. If you continue that sort of thing, we'll have to let you go. Uh, this is, uh, uh, how can you afford to have a commercial catalyst with platinum on it? Well, I forgot it. But uh, <coughs> when I was at Hoodry, uh, Sun Oil had, who was of course a parent of uh, Hoodry, had uh, heard rumors of UOP having a, a precious metal uh, catalyst for dehydrogenation. And uh, so they wanted to, uh, they asked us, could we produce such a catalyst? And uh, uh, Millikan and his crew uh, made a platinum on a gamma alumina uh, catalyst and it was tested. We built a little pilot plant, the reactor pilot plant, and it worked very well. That was the beginning of food reforming, which of course competed for a while with platforming. Of course, well, Hansel and platforming were first and uh, they had all the original patents. But uh, Houdry was very lucky uh, in that uh, early, uh, well, we found very early on that uh, this process worked better when we added a little uh, chlorine or HCl to it uh, after impregnating 
the aluminibus chloroplatinic acid, we could maintain activity by adding a little HCl or chlorine to it. And we applied for patents and immediately, not immediately, very shortly after found that we were uh, competing with a patent that Well Hensel had filed on very much the same thing. And uh, it turned out that UOP hadn't thought much of this patent application of Hensel's and failed to file abroad and under the, uh, in the convention period. And Trudri, on the other hand, had thought enough of it to file in many countries overseas. And uh, so it came about that UOP had the patent on HCL addition in the United States, and Hudri held the same patent abroad. And so the companies eventually got together and they got cross-licensing, and I think Val has never forgiven me <laughs> for that. Uh, but uh, uh, you asked about the work on dual functional catalysis. Actually, uh, we wanted to understand the whole business of uh, uh, reforming a little better. And so we started doing a lot of work with pure compounds uh, normal heptane, normal octane, cyclohexane, methylcyclohexane, methylcyclopentane and arrived at the scheme that's known as the Mills uh, et al. Uh, system for, uh, uh, for, uh, oxide for uh, dehydrogenation, isomerization, etc. But it strictly came out of a wish to understand and improve the reforming process. What was unique about Hudry working there during that period? Oh, uh, I think what was unique, I mean, in my good many years of experience in catalysis research, I have worked only with two groups that were uh, as uh, cooperative with each other. It was a wonderful atmosphere. You could, you talked freely, you discussed what you wanted. Uh, the immediate management, in that case, Oglat and Mills, uh, were very encouraging to letting you do what you wanted to do and make your own mistakes. And uh, Alex Oglat always took the position you hire good people and let them go to work. Don't tell them what to do. And uh, uh, so uh, that uh, uh, it was a wonderful atmosphere. We were all friends. We were closely together. And nobody minded who went first on a patent or second on a patent or on the publication. And uh, they had a fairly liberal publication policy. So it was a great team to work with. And I think the same, somewhat different, was true with the team Paul Weiss had at uh, Central Research in Mobile. Uh, that uh, uh, there was a lot of inspiration there. It was a very good place to work. What is your impression of the way company research is going now? Terrible. <laughs> I think it's awful. When, when I looked, uh, listened to uh, Ian Maxwell this morning, uh, I th and he showed these uh, uh, slides of uh, alliances. I thought that's the death of uh, a creative research because uh, 
Which that means a group of company decides what the problem is, and uh, uh, then they select uh, some group to work on it, and to the exclusion of everybody else and any new ideas are doing it differently. There's no competition. I mean, I think uh, what has, uh, I have always felt that progress made in industrial catalysis is never, has never been the work of one individual. You can credit one individual with having being the first with an idea. But if he hadn't done it, somebody else within a few years would have done the same thing. But I think under that system, that's not possible because uh, uh, it's anti-competitive. And uh, uh, I think it's, it's the death of, uh, of uh, creative research, industrial research. Well, when you went to Switzerland, did your family go with you, or did you no, go alone? No. Well, uh, when I went to Switzerland, I went by myself. And I came to this country by myself. I brought my parents over uh, a few years later. And, uh, how, how did you get them out? Well, they happened to go to England as refugees just before the war started. And I applied for visa for them and furnished uh, the guarantees, which I couldn't very well, <laughs> but uh, did anyhow. And uh, so they came to this country during, towards the end of the war in a convoy. My father was a patent attorney, and uh, he worked uh, uh, in this country in the last year, two years of the war, uh, as sort of a substitute for a man who had been drafted. And uh, of course, when the man returned, he from the army, he took his job again. My father was quite elderly at that time, uh, did a little consulting, uh, patent fee. Now how did they arrange to go to England? Was that... Uh... Well, they, were, uh, they went to England because I had provided the guarantees for a visa to the United States, but they... Uh, you know, at that time, there was the number of visas that could be issued was very mm -hmm. limited. And that means meant they had a two or three year waiting period. And uh, uh, the British accepted them uh, on the basis of their eventually getting a visa for the United States. And uh, they are not working in England, of course. Since England was at war a few months later, that went out the window. They wanted anybody who could work to work. But uh, uh, that's the, the way they got to England. But how did they get the passport or visa to leave Germany? That the, was difficult? The Germans were glad to let them go. Oh. They couldn't take anything with them, mm -hmm. other than clothing a few things like that, but certainly no money. I mean, I came to the United States in '38, and when I landed, I had exactly ten dollars in my pocket. And I had some friends of my father's in New York who uh, gave me some money and helped me until I found my first job. But uh, you never could bring bring money. Out. Now, did you speak English when you landed? Yes, or? yes, I, I spoke well, some sort of English. I went to, of course, when I landed in New York, I, I stayed in New York for about a month until I got a job in Shreveport, Louisiana. And, uh, uh, but uh, when I, uh, I 
had some difficulties with the language, of course, uh, because what I had learned was the British English and in high school. And uh, well, uh, I went to, I think it was Alliance in New York one day, and I saw on the menu uh, chocolate pie. I couldn't imagine what the chocolate I had. I had pies to me were meat pies. Oh. So I asked the waitress, what's chocolate pie? And she looked at me and said, you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of experiences where when one has as long a life and career <laughs> as I have had. But it's been fun. Well, let's leave it at that.